Good morning, everyone. And welcome to worship in First Oma this morning. It's lovely to have you gathered here with us this morning and for our Jigsaw and Blast children and young people uh, to be meeting in our hall. As we have done since uh, we reopened from the first lockdown, we're going to turn to one another and give each other a wave of welcome, remembering to wave to those in the gallery as well. We're having a few uh, little technical issues this morning, so hopefully uh, they will be resolved. Um, I know that Carl and Eva are working away there, um, bringing us up to speed. I want to draw your attention to a number of notices. Uh, The first one is in relation to the Presbyterian Church in Ireland's General Assembly. It normally takes place in June, but because of the pandemic was postponed until October. So it's going to take place from tomorrow until Wednesday in assembly buildings in Church House. Myself and David Vance will be the representatives of this congregation at the General Assembly. And the business has been condensed into three days. uh, So um, I will be out of contact, shall we say, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday until about 9.30 in the evening. But please do leave a message on my mobile number if you need to contact me. And if there's a break in business or an appropriate moment, I can leave the house and answer the call. Hopefully there won't be a need to contact me, but just in case, please don't leave a message on the month's cause, uh, phone number because I'll not be able to return that call until Wednesday evening or Thursday morning. Uh, the other uh, notice that I'd like to draw to your attention is our harvest services next week and the following week we're going to have our harvest Thanksgiving. On Sunday the 10th it will be for those with surname beginning with A to H. And Blast and Jigsaw will meet as normal in the Rowan Hall and in the youth room. I will be the preacher that Sunday and um, I hope that many people will be able to come out uh, to that Harvest Thanksgiving service. If for whatever reason the Sunday the 10th doesn't suit you, if your surname's A to H, then feel free to come the following week, I to Z. It will take place on the 17th of October for surnames I to Z and the preacher will be Mr Henry Coulter who's from the International Meeting Point in Belfast and works with refugees coming to live in Northern Ireland and his focus will be on uh, the book of Ruth, that um, wonderful book which talks about the foreigner Ruth being welcomed into Bethlehem and into the community there. Uh, Jigsaw and Blast won't meet on the 17th of October, but we're encouraging parents and children uh, to come out to the harvest service so that the children will have an opportunity to attend one of our harvest services. So whilst we've done the alphabetical split A to H and I to Z, there is a little bit of flexibility. But can I ask those who do come next week, don't come the following week, um, so that those who do come next, the following week are able to get a seat, just in case uh, we have an overflow situation. And then another notice with regards to opening up again. Uh, The Kirk Session have given permission to a number of organisations to reopen and uh, the Bible study on a Thursday evening will commence on Thursday the 14th of October, 10.30am in the youth room with Audrey and 7 o'clock in the lecture hall with myself. The course looks at eight great things about being a member of a church. Things like belonging, caring, serving and sending. There will be a short uh, video to watch, a Bible passage to study and then an opportunity to spend time discussing what it looks like in practice. We will be socially distanced and complying with all the regulations uh, to ensure the safety of our participants. But please contact either myself or Audrey in order to let us know that you're coming and also to order the accompanying book. It should be a good series as we refocus on starting up our congregational life and witness once again. The rest of the notices you'll be able to find on our Facebook page and our website. Let us now come before our God in worship as we come before him in prayer. In your wisdom, O God, you call us here to worship you. We gather to hear and respond to your living word. You call us to be fully present, ready to listen and respond with heart, 
soul, strength and mind. We listen attentively to your word for us today. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom, sometimes startling and unexpected, sometimes still and quiet, but always dwelling amongst us. We watch and wait for the word of God to refresh our souls and call us to love and serve us. O holy God and most gracious Father, we are embarrassed to come before you this morning because we have preferred the ways of this world to your ways. We have rebelled against your wisdom and landed ourselves in trouble. We have rejected your fatherly guidance and find ourselves living far from you. Most gracious Father, filled with mercy and steadfast love, incline your ear to our troubles. Hear us when we pour out our sorrows before us. Forgive us, not on the grounds of our own righteousness, but on the grounds of your great mercy displayed in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we ask for forgiveness because he is our saviour and the mediator of your covenant of mercy and grace. We thank you that in him we find forgiveness of sin, are cleansed from our unrighteousness and restored to love and service in the church and in the world. And so we join together in the prayer which he taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue in worship as we stand to sing hymn number 196, We Love the Place, O God. And we'll be singing verses 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6. But you don't need to worry, the words will appear on the screen. to take this opportunity to thank Daryl and David for leading us in our praises uh, this morning. 
We turn now to God's word and Janice Vance will read to us from James chapter 5 verses 13 to 20. Let us listen to God's word to us this morning. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Thank you, Janice. And so we reach the end of James' letter to the early church. I hope that you, like me, have been encouraged as well as challenged by James's words of wisdom about the importance of putting our faith, what we confess with our lips, into action in how we live our lives. James' letter is a very practical one, reminding us to guard our tongues, to refrain from quarreling with one another, to not show favoritism, but to love our neighbors as ourselves, to seek to follow the wisdom of God and not the wisdom of this world, and to be doers of the word as well as hearers of it. The letter packs quite a punch, only being five chapters long, but running through all this wise advice is a deep and abiding love and faith in God and in Jesus Christ. James's faith was thoroughly tested by persecution and trial and also error. He discovered that no matter what the world might throw at him, the solution to every problem is a simple one for the Christian. Take it to the Lord in prayer, whatever the it is. In the concluding chapter of his letter, James highlights four areas which the Christian should take to the Lord in prayer. The first area is trouble. Trouble with a capital T. We can all identify with this, can't we? We have all found ourselves in trouble in one way or another. Whether that's trouble of our own making because of gossiping or telling fibs or falling out with others over selfish things or whether it's trouble caused by others, by ridicule, by persecution, by unjust actions, by a time of hardship not of our own making, a problem, a time of trouble that we can see no way of solving. James' advice is simple. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Pour out your heart to him. Tell him what's on your mind. What's burdening your soul? Seek his help in providing solutions to the problem you face. Be guided by his wisdom and his word, even if that word is a tough one to hear. A word that might be wait. A word that might be repent. A word that might be forgive. Or it might be a word of encouragement like, I am with you. I will not forsake you. Do not be afraid. Trust in me. So 
Sometimes those prayers for help that we will utter will be simple and short. Help me, Lord. At other times they might be long and complex as we try to articulate, to put into words how we're feeling, or to gain some sort of an understanding or perspective on the troubles that we face. Sometimes we might not know what to say or how to say it. And the book of Psalms is a great resource for those who are struggling to put their prayers into words. In Psalm 86, we hear the psalmist crying, Hear me, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. He lays it out before the Lord. Then in Psalm 79, it says that the psalmist, the author of the psalm, is on the brink of despair. He lets his emotions be known before the Lord. He knows us. He cares for us. We can be completely honest with God about how we're feeling. Psalm 16 is a cry for protection from danger. And Psalm 31 is a plea for mercy. So there, there are four Psalms which articulate uh, prayers that were issued for individuals and for families and for communities that were facing particular trouble. When we find ourselves in trouble, the first thing we should do is turn to God in prayer and he will hear those prayers and provide us with the help we need. Thankfully, in this life, uh, it's not all doom and gloom and troubles and woes. There are also times of great joy and blessing. James reminds us to bring those times before the Lord in prayer as well. But those prayers will be songs of praise, thanking God for his goodness to us, rejoicing in his love and in his blessing, delighting in the world that he has given us to live in. Sometimes we only turn to God when we are in trouble, when we need his help. Then when the answer comes, we forget to thank him for the solution he has given to us. James reminds us that our prayer life should reflect every human emotion, however we feel, whether we're happy or sad, whether we're stressed or enjoying life, whether we're filled with anger at the injustice in this world, or whether we're overflowing with love and kindness towards others. In all these ways, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. And one wonderful prayer of praise is Mary's Magnificat. It's often only read during the Advent season, but it is such a powerful prayer of praise, rejoicing in God's goodness, in his justice, and in his mercy. So why not take some time this week to read that for yourself? It's found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. And then maybe take it and use it as your own prayer of praise, or maybe even write one of your own. And contact Daryl if you'd like it put to music, we never know. We could end up with some original psalms and songs of praise flowing from the heart of God's people. The third area that James tells us to take to the Lord in prayer is when we are sick. Is anyone sick, says James? If so, ask the elders to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. There's no doubt that when we are poorly, when we've been diagnosed with a serious illness, or when we've suffered a dreadful injury, we are in much need of help. What is the Christian to do? James says that you are to call the elders of the church to pray over you. The request for prayer comes from the individual who is sick to the church leaders. The request for prayer comes from the sick person to those leaders. James encourages us to ask for prayer. That's not always easy to do, is it? Our health is a very private matter, but I can assure you that any request that is made will be treated with confidentiality. One of the greatest privileges of being a minister and a hospital chaplain is being able to visit the sick and to pray with them, whether that's in their own homes, in the hospital, 
or on their deathbed. Sickness is a great leveller. Whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you've great faith or whether you've no faith, when you find yourself on your sickbed, you realise that life is indeed very fragile. One of my greatest stresses over the last 18 months was the inability to visit people who were sick in hospital and to be mindful about visiting people in their homes, particularly those who are vulnerable. I'm grateful for modern technology that enabled me to continue to pray with people over the phone and via video messenger where possible. And I'm grateful that the situation has improved that enables me now to pray with people in person once again, obviously taking precautions. And it's wonderful to see prayers answered, isn't it? With an individual's return to health and strength, or with them receiving the courage and the strength that they need to face the ongoing challenges they face. And even to be with someone and see the peace that passes all understanding when the person faces their last days or hours on earth in prayer before the Lord. Now, I'm not the only one who prays in this congregation and who prays for the sick. Many of you pray regularly for those that you know who are sick or in pain, whether because you're a district elder and someone comes to you and asks for prayer, or whether it's because of a personal friend or family member, and you will pray for them in their time of sickness. We also have a prayer chain group who regularly and faithfully uphold those who are sick in prayer before God. They too are humbled and full of gratitude when those prayers are answered and the individual is healed or finds peace with God in the midst of their trial. So please do ask for prayer from myself, from the elders, from the prayer chain, from a faithful Christian friend, and allow them to uphold you in a time when perhaps you're unable to express your own prayers because of your sickness and your concern. But maybe you were listening closely to the text and you heard about the anointing of oil and you thought, well, Jane doesn't do that whenever she comes to visit me or when she came to visit so-and-so. And it's not something that's regularly offered by our particular church tradition. And some commentators, when they see the prayer and the anointing of, the, of oil, see it as a twofold ministry, prayer and practical help. And that ties in so well with James, doesn't it? Prayer alongside practical help. At the time of the early church, they didn't have the NHS or hospitals. They didn't even have GP surgeries and the whole plethora of health professionals that we have access to. And so the medical care was very basic indeed. And so often they would have turned to the leaders in their community when they were in a time of crisis. And often people would have carried some oil with them, which would have been used to provide relief from pain and sickness. You will remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. He poured oil on the wounds. He had oil with him, antiseptic oil or, or medicinal oil that helped to treat the man's wounds. He bandaged him up and took him to an inn for him to recover. So that may be perhaps the anointing of oil that's being referred to in James 5. But modern medical and nursing care stems from Christian compassion and care for the sick. Our NHS was founded by Christians who advocated for free health care for all the citizens. It's under tremendous pressure at the moment, but we are grateful for the services that they provide. But the medical and the nursing care still goes hand in hand with the prayer for the sick. I am one of the hospital chaplains here in the, in the West Health and Social Care Trust. And so I can go into the hospital and provide a pastoral prayer to those who are sick alongside the nursing and medical care that's provided so that the patient receives holistic care 
both the medical and the nursing and the spiritual care they need. And when all those three are combined, then we see God's hope, God's healing and God's peace for those who are sick. The fourth area for prayer is an even more challenging one for us personally, I think, than prayer. James encourages us to confess our sins to one another and to pray that we'll be healed. Now, again, it's not a tradition that that would uh, be in the forefront of our uh, particular denomination, the confession of sins to one another. We often just confess our sins to God. But there's no doubt that sin has a devastating consequence for us. It can cause physical illness and injury. It can destroy our minds and affect our emotions and our spiritual well-being. We all know that sin is a barrier between us and God and that in Christ we can receive forgiveness from sin when we turn to God in prayer. But there's also then the relationship that we have with one another. Sinfulness can damage our relationships. We can fall out with one another. We can hurt another by our words or our actions. Sometimes we know it when we're doing it. Sometimes we're not even aware that we've done it. So unless we confess to one another how we're feeling, then that sin, that problem that's in our lives and in our relationships can't be healed and instead it festers and destroys fellowship. So we need to be open and honest with one another. We need to be willing to forgive one another and in so doing receive healing and wholeness. Another challenging word from James, but he reminds us of the tremendous power of prayer. When a righteous person prays, someone who's willing to submit to God's authority and not on their own terms, then that, po- that prayer is powerful and effective. It will accomplish what it asks. And if it is asked under the will and under the authority of God, then it will come to fruition. And that can be hard to understand sometimes, can't it? So James gives a practical example of someone who was a righteous man of prayer, and that was Elijah. He prayed fervently and faithfully that there would be no rain on the land for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain and the heavens opened and the earth produced an abundant crop. Elijah did not pray to show that he was powerful and effective as a human being. He prayed so that God would be revealed as powerful and effective in our world. Our prayer should be offered not to make us look good, but to bring glory and honour to the God we serve. But it is good to hear the testimony of answered prayer, to be encouraged by the prayers of others, and to have confidence that our prayers will be answered and heard when they are offered in faith before our God. And the last life problem to be addressed by James is the what if someone wanders away? This is so often the case in the church these days. People make profession of their faith and then drift away from living out a life of faith. Tempted by that easy and broad road of worldly wisdom and selfish indulgence. People who bit by bit and day by day wander far from God. People who might even be here in church Sunday by Sunday or watching online Sunday by Sunday, but whose Monday to Saturday lives bears little resemblance to a life of faith in action. They are people who are known as bitter and envious, jealous, greedy, exploitative, hurtful, Pride, self-seeking, gossipers, the list goes on and on. What are we to do when this happens in the church? The easiest option is to do nothing, isn't it? Let them wander away. It's their life after all, and it's their choice. But we do that if it was our toddler putting their hand in the fire. 
Will we do it if it was our child in primary school, hitting and picking on others in the playground? Would we do that if it was our teenager, stealing from home in order to pay for drink and drugs? No, we wouldn't let them just wander away. We would do something about it, wouldn't we? We'd warn them. We'd correct them. We might even punish them in order to get them to realise that the actions they were taking were wrong. Why would we do that as parents? We do it because we love our children. We want them to grow and develop into mature, talented, confident and respected adults. And that's what Jesus longs for in the church. He longs for brothers and sisters to be people who are mature in their faith and who live that faith out in their daily lives. That's why he wrote the letter to James, the letter of James. That's why James wrote the letter to the churches. It was a letter to challenge the worldly behaviours that he was seeing develop in the church. His letter was not a harsh, judgmental letter of condemnation, but a loving, corrective, challenging letter, calling people back from their foolish wandering, a wandering that will lead to death and destruction. Instead, he wants them to see the error of their own ways, return to him and his loving compassion, receive the forgiveness that God has to offer, and then seek to live out their lives in faith and action. To see their lives where their lips, what they confess with their lips, is synchronized with what they do with their hands and their hearts. A life where love, compassion, and the mercy of God flows freely amongst the fellowship and spills over into the world, calling others to this life-giving, enriching way of life that leads to an eternity with God. Choose wisely, says James, and pray faithfully so that you too will experience the joy of living a life of faith and service to our great and powerful God who hears and responds to the prayers of his faithful people. Amen. And we thank God for his words to us um, over the last number of weeks through the letter of James. Uh, may we apply it to our heart and our mind and our actions and our service. As I mentioned at the start of the service, we uh, move into the General Assembly this incoming week, and so I want to focus our prayers for others on the General Assembly. So let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord of the Church, we come before you this morning to pray for the work and the witness of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland and to pray for the General Assembly taking place this week. We pray for the moderator, Dr. David Bruce, as he leads us in worship and conducts the business of the Assembly. And we pray for the clerk and deputy clerk as they support him. We ask, O oh Lord, that speeches and debates would be helpful and informative and encouraging, enabling ministers and representative elders to discern your will as they deliberate and decide upon the resolutions before them. At this time of COVID restriction, we pray for all Assembly House staff as they work to ensure delegates can meet safely and that the Assembly business runs smoothly. We pray also for the wide remit of the work undertaken by the Council and Committees of our Church as they seek to support and help the wider Church. In particular, we pray for the work of the Council of Social Witness as it supports the running of PCI nursing homes, residential care homes and specialist homes in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland. We pray for the staff and residents in these homes who have come through an extremely challenging year and a half. And we ask, O oh Lord, that they would be kept safe from further virus outbreaks, that staff would receive the energy and compassion they need to carry out their work, and that residents would feel safe and secure and content in their twilight years. 
We pray also for the Secretary of the Council, Lindsay Conway, as he approaches his retirement. And we seek wisdom and guidance in the appointment of his successor for such an important role within our denomination. We pray for the wide remit of work given to the General Council and for the work of the Council of Public Affairs. We pray for wisdom and guidance as sensitive and sometimes contentious issues are discussed and debated on the floor of the Assembly and that decisions made will be with sensitivity and grace to bring glory and honour to you and to the Church which meets in your name. Finally, we pray for the staff of the Congregation of Life and Witness as they seek to accompany and support congregations throughout the length and breadth of this island, some who are large and urban, others who are small and rural, some with a long history of Christian worship and witness, others who are just beginning ministry and mission. We pray that the Council's work would encourage and inspire congregations as they emerge from COVID restrictions and as they seek to restart mission and ministry in their own unique situations and settings. We rejoice, O Lord, that you are Lord of the Church and that you have said that the gates of hell will not prevail against her. And so we pray, Lord, for confidence and courage and vision for all our congregations as we meet together for worship, as we grow in discipleship and fellowship, and as we seek to share your gospel of life and hope to those around us. May your kingdom come and may your will be done in the church and in the world. Amen. As we bring our service of worship to a close and as we bring the series of the book of James to a close, I uh, discovered a hymn on the internet that's based on the book of James and so uh, we're going to sing that this morning. So thanks to David and to Daryl uh, who will be leading us in it. I think the tune should be fairly familiar uh, but uh, if not, uh, we'll get through it, won't we? Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, so uh, the hymn is, O Lord, May All We Say and Do. Let's stand. Uh, maybe, Dar, if you play the tune over once, that might be helpful. And uh, then uh, we'll stand to sing the hymn. Thank you. Oh, 
chance to rust away, but your love fills us every day through prayer and service. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. People in the transept and people on the right. Mm -hmm.